Welcome to The Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Flummer. While this episode is called Classical Compatibilism, we are going to cover several different related forms of compatibilism. We begin with the classical view of Thomas Hobbes and David Hume, and then turn to the conditional analysis of ability, which was popular in much of the 20th century. Our guest in this episode is Helen Beebe, and after discussing the classical view, we ask her about her work on more recent forms of compatibilism, including local miracle compatibilism and Humean compatibilism. As always, if you have questions that you'd like us to answer in our Q&A episode at the end of the season, get in touch with us through our website, thefreewillshow.com, or through social media at The Free Will Show. I'm happy to introduce Helen Beebe. Helen is the Samuel Hall Professor of Philosophy at the University of Manchester. She has written extensively on free will and related topics in metaphysics, such as causation and the laws of nature. And she's the author of Free Will, an Introduction, published by Palgrave in 2013. So thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the show, Helen. Can you tell us and our audience a bit about yourself, your work, and how you came to be interested in working on free will? Yes. Yeah, so uh, as you say, I'm a professor at the University of Manchester, which is in the north of England. Um, I found myself kind of strangely attracted to a broadly Humean worldview when I was an undergraduate. Um, I, the Humean worldview is basically the view that there isn't any feature of the world that answers to words like necessity and essence. Uh, so we have to tell some kind of complicated story about what we mean when we use those words. Uh, it's not kind of like picking out some intrinsic feature of the world. Um, I think uh, I I kind of got attracted to that worldview because I, I, I read loads of Quine when I was an undergraduate, not particularly mm. um, through my own desire. That was just the way that my courses panned out. <laughs> um and then I wrote my PhD on causation, uh, which introduced me to the work of David Lewis. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I imagine we're going to get onto him later. Uh, right. mm -hmm. And I got interested in free will because I met Al Mealy, uh, who's obviously a big name mm -hmm. in the free will world, uh, when I was a postdoc at the Australian National University. Uh, and I kind of started talking to him about free will. And that made me think that there was maybe a connection between the question of whether or not we have free will and the question about kind of whether or not the laws involve the kind of necessity that I've always been ideologically hostile to. Um, mm -hmm. And that seems to be an issue that nobody had really talked about in the, or not very many people had really talked about in the free will literature. So one thing led to another, really. Uh, uh, Al and I wrote a paper uh, called Humean Compatibilism. Uh, and then I started thinking about Lewis's view about free will, which I think is connected to his view about laws of nature, which is basically a Humean view. Uh, mm -hmm. So free will's kind of been a sort of side interest of mine uh, since then, alongside issues about humanism, about causation and laws, uh, and Hume himself. And actually, Lewis himself, uh, I just finished, uh, two, I co-edited with Anthony Fisher two huge volumes of uh, David Lewis's correspondence, uh, which I'm very glad to have off my desk, available <laughs> in bookshops now. Nice. So yeah, that's me. <laughs> yeah, excellent. Thank you for that. Our last four episodes were about various incompatibilist positions in the free will debate, but today we're going to talk about compatibilism, which, as the name suggests, says that free will and determinism are actually compatible with each other. Sometimes people talk about the free will debate as though we had to choose between free will and determinism. Sometimes you'll hear people say free will versus determinism. But compatibilists take this to be a false dilemma. Could you start by saying a bit about how classical compatibilists like Thomas Hobbes and David Hume thought about free will and why they thought it was compatible with determinism? Yeah, so oh, uh, I get so annoyed when people say free will versus determinism. Uh, I have to keep <laughs> instructing my students not to say it because it just kind of comes out of their mouths all the time. I mean... That just assumes incompatibilism, right? Um, and right. I don't even think incompatibilism is true, let alone something that we're just entitled to kind of uncritically assume without even having considered the compatibilist perspective. So I really object when people say free will versus <laughs> determinism. Um, so I guess the first thing to say about classical compatibilism uh, is that on a classical compatibilist view, I. Uh, the whole expression free will in a way is something of a misnomer because it kind of suggests that the issue is whether this kind of psychological faculty, the will, has this property of being free. 
uh, and classical compatibilists thought, or while they did think that there was indeed such a psychological faculty as the will, they basically thought it didn't make any sense to ask whether it was free. So the first move, if you like, of classical compatibilism is to shift our attention from the question of whether the will is free, which classical compatibilists basically thought was a, you know, co incoherent question, really, mm -hmm. um, to the perfectly intelligible question of whether or in what circumstances we act freely. So the question of free will is really, for classical compatibilists, the question about um, act free action. Um, yeah. And at that point, the classical compatibilist claims that, well, that question, that question about the circumstances under which we act freely, has a very straightforward and extremely undemanding answer, which is, look, we act freely just if we do the things that we will or we want to do. Um, mm -hmm. And we do that just if there are no external impediments to doing what we want. So Hume famously defined what he called liberty as, and this is now just a quote from Hume, uh, the power of acting or not acting according to the determination of the will. That is, if we choose to remain at rest, we may. If we choose to move, we also may. This hypothetical liberty is universally allowed to belong to everyone who is not a prisoner and in chains. So conceived in that way, liberty or free will or free action, whatever you want to call it, is obviously going to turn out to be compatible with determinism, right? I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even if the facts about the laws of nature and the past determined that I'm sitting here at my desk right now, those facts aren't literally imprisoning me in the room. <laughs> I'm not chained to my desk. I want to be here now talking to you, and that's why I'm doing it. And according to the classical compatibilist, that just suffices for my doing it freely. So acting freely is really easy and deterministic agents do it all the time. That's awesome. Excellent. So um, despite its popularity in the modern period, this view has since come under fire and it's not very popular anymore. I, I suppose that's an understatement. I don't know of anyone who holds this view anymore. So what are some of the problems for the simple classical view? Yeah, it hasn't fared very well. Uh, I guess the main problem with it is that it only conceives external impediments like being in a locked room or being in chains um, as impediments to acting freely. And it just looks like that that's too weak a constraint um, for kind of two. Well, I can't decide whether it's two reasons or, or one reason, but let's call it two reasons. Uh, so one is there are surely cases where you get to do what you want and yet you still aren't acting freely. Uh, so you might think of coercion as being this kind of case. So um, yeah. if you threaten to murder my cat unless I steal some sweets for you uh, and I therefore steal the sweets, you know, there's a sense in which I wanted to steal the sweets, all things considered. I mean, I'd rather mm -hmm. you hadn't put me in this position, but given the position I'm in, I do actually want to steal the sweets because I don't want you to murder my cat and stealing the sweets um, turns out to be the only way to avoid you doing that. Right. Uh, so I'm doing what I wanted, but uh, looks as though I didn't steal the sweets freely. Uh, or at any rate, it's you and uh, like if we ask who's culpable for the theft, it kind of looks like it's you and not me, right? Yeah. So if we think that acting freely is a requirement on culpability or moral responsibility, it's pretty natural to say that the reason why I'm not culpable is that I didn't freely steal the sweet, uh, even though I did the thing that in the unfortunate situ situation that I found myself in, uh, I wanted to do, right? So I'm, I'm doing what I wanted, uh, but it doesn't look as though I, I did it freely. So that's kind of a counterexample to the classical view. Um, mm -hmm. And the other reason why the no external impediments constraint looks too weak is that sometimes the impediment is internal rather than external. Uh, so think of someone who's acting on the basis of a pathological phobia or maybe an addiction or they've been hypnotized or they just lack some relevant skill or whatever. Uh, so someone who's pathologically terrified of water just can't jump into the pond to save the drowning cat. I seem to be on a cat roll. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, uh, maybe they want to save the cat. Maybe they don't. It doesn't really matter. But like they can't. They can't mm -hmm. jump into the pond to save the drowning cat. Um, or someone who isn't terrified of water, but they just simply never learnt to swim. Uh, so if they jumped in, reasonable hypothesis, the cat still drowns and they drown as well. Uh, it would be absurd of them to jump into the water. Right. That's not going to help. Right. Um, 
So they might want to save the cat, um, but I, they can't because they never learn to swim. So they're not culpable for failing to save the cat either. So in both of those cases, the kind of phobia case and just the I never learned to swim case, the impediment to doing what you want to do, which is to save the cat, um, is an internal rather than external one, right? No one's stopping them jumping in. It's them that's stopping them jumping in for one reason or another. So, yeah, classical compatibilism, yeah, there are just too many problems with it. And and the basic problem is that the uh, in only thinking of external impediments as impediments to acting freely, they're missing out all the cases where there are internal impediments. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One worry for compatibilists is the consequence argument, which we've talked about several times on the show. This argument aims to show that if determinism is true, then no one can do otherwise than what they actually do. In response to this worry, some classical compatibilists, following suggestions from Hume, have offered a conditional analysis of ability. Could you explain the conditional analysis and how it's meant to help the compatibilist? Yeah, so uh, actually I quoted the relevant bit of Hume earlier, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. If we choose to remain at rest, we may. If we choose to move, we also may. So so let's say uh, earlier this afternoon, I was wondering whether to go downstairs and put the kettle on. um, And because I actually wanted some coffee, uh, I did go downstairs and put the kettle on. Um, And let's grant that everything that happened, my wanting the coffee, my deciding to go and make the coffee, my getting up from my chair, my going downstairs, putting the kettle on, all of that was determined by the past plus the laws. Uh, It seems to follow, and obviously this is what the consequence argument tries to establish, that I couldn't have done anything else than make the coffee. Uh, The past plus the laws determined me to do it. Uh, I was just doing what the laws dictated that I would do. So what the conditional analysis says is, Uh, Yeah, a grant that the powers plus the laws determined that I do all that stuff doesn't follow that I was unable to do otherwise, because what it takes for me to be able to do otherwise is uh, that if I'd wanted to stay sitting at my desk, I would have done that instead, right? The possibility Mm -hmm. of my staying at my desk was open to me, not in the sense that the past plus the laws left it open, because they didn't, if determinism is true, but in the sense that if I'd wanted to do it, that's what I would have done, right? So mm-hmm. the ability to do otherwise turns out to be, uh, right, so if I if I choose to remain at rest, I may. If I choose to move, I also may. Uh, uh, what I do, so this kind of goes back to the classical compatibilist view, right? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm doing the thing I want, whatever I want to do, um, so when I want to do one thing and do it, uh, it's still true that I could have done the other thing because if I'd wanted to do that thing, I would have done that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that conditional analysis was popular for a good bit of the last century, but I think it's safe to say that most philosophers nowadays have given up on at least the simple version of the conditional analysis. Uh, we'll talk about a recent development of the view uh, called dispositional compatibilism next time. Uh, But people have given up on uh, the simple view, mainly because of certain alleged counterexamples uh, like the following. Um, It's related to your uh, water phobia case. Imagine that uh, someone has a phobia of taking candies that are the color red. This is a classic example from the literature. Um, If they have a phobia, it looks like they can't reach out and take a piece of red candy from a bowl. And yet it's true that if they had wanted to or desired to take the red candy, then they would. They just have a phobia that prevents them from desiring that in the first place. So this looks like a case where the conditional analysis says a person has an ability when it turns out they they lack it. So uh, do you think that examples like this show that the conditional analysis is uh, false? Or do you have any other thoughts on the conditional analysis of ability? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um... I do think that that kind of example undermines the simple version. And as you say, for pretty much the same reasons uh, that I was giving in the case of classical compatibilism, Mm -hmm. right? So just sometimes as a matter of psychological fact, our desires and our choices just aren't under our control. Uh, And and at least in one sense of control, uh, one way of spelling out why they're not under control is that we're only able to do the thing we do. We weren't able to do anything else. So any viable account of the ability to do otherwise needs to tell a story about why those kinds of cases, the pathological fear of red or whatever, um, uh, why those aren't cases of the ability to do otherwise. Um, so I think the, I'm so glad that you're getting someone else to explain the dispositional view and not the 
really complicated. Uh, but I, 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 I'm pretty sure that, I mean, those are very much in the spirit of the conditional analysis. And mm -hmm. uh, as far as I can tell, one or other of them um, looks like it's going to work perfectly well. So I would be, um, so I think the right move there is just to move from a conditional analysis. If you want to uphold the ability to do otherwise mm -hmm. as a requirement on freedom, uh, and you want to be a compatibilist, uh, the dispositional view is definitely the way to go. Hmm. Yeah. Well, in our interview with Peter Van Inwagen about the consequence argument, we made reference to a reply to the argument by David Lewis. According to the reply, which is sometimes called local miracle compatibilism, there is a sense in which the laws of nature are up to us. Can you give us a sketch of this reply? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it's, <laughs> sketch. It's a long and complicated story. Um, yeah. I, I will try and and sum it up uh, in not uh, not take up too much time. Uh, right. So uh, the consequence argument uh, claims to establish that I couldn't have done otherwise than make the coffee on the basis of the alleged fact that I couldn't do anything about the book what the laws of nature are, and I couldn't do anything about the distant past either. And so I couldn't do anything about the consequences of the distant past plus the laws, uh, including my having gone and made coffee earlier. So any compatibilist who thinks that we are, in fact, able to do otherwise, even if determinism is true, uh, and that applies to people who endorse the conditional analysis or the dispositional account or some other account of the ability to do otherwise. Uh, they obviously deny the conclusion of, the, of, of that argument, right, that we, that we uh, the conclusion being that we can't do anything about the consequences of the distance past past the laws. Um, but they still owe us an explanation of where exactly the argument's gone wrong, right? It's not, allowed to, it's not enough to just go, oh, well, according to my story about the ability to do otherwise, your conclusion is false, right? We've got a perfectly good-looking argument here. We need to say where the argument's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So where has it gone wrong? Uh, so you've either got to claim that being unable to do anything about the laws in the distant past doesn't, in fact, entail being able to do, unable to do otherwise than what we actually do, or... Uh, you've got to claim that we are, in fact, able to do something about the laws or the distant past. So Lewis uh, thinks that deterministic agents are indeed sometimes able to do otherwise. Uh, that's the compatibilism part of the local miracle compatibilism. Uh, although he doesn't in that paper uh, offer his own analysis of what it is to be able to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, he, this is a side uh, comment, but he uh, was writing a paper on that very issue, what it is to be able uh, to have an ability uh, before he died. Uh, and uh, we just got published. The, it's just a kind of like bullet pointed paper summary. We just published it recently. So I'm hoping that that will um, uh, some people will get interested in that. I'm not yeah. entirely sure the view's going to yeah. work out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to tell because it's just a bunch of bullet points. I'm sure right. if he'd actually written up the paper, he would have nailed all the worries down. But sadly, I <laughs> uh, don't know what was in his head. Anyway, uh, so uh, in the paper where he's uh, uh, presenting what's become known as the local miracle compatibilist view. He's not telling a story about what it is to be able to do otherwise. He's just responding to the consequence argument. So his aim is to plug that gap that I just mentioned, right? To give a story about which premise in the consequent argument, consequence argument can reasonably be denied by the compatibilist. Uh, and his paper is called, Are We Free to Break the Laws? Which kind of gives us a clue about which premise mm -hmm. it's going to be. Mm -hmm. It's the premise that says that we can't do anything about the laws. Uh, or to put it uh, in a sort of uh, a slightly different way, we can't break the laws of nature, right? So think of the relevant premise of the consequence argument as just the premise that we can't break the laws of nature. Uh, and what he's going to do is claim that it's actually that premise is ambiguous. And once we disambiguate it, we'll see that the argument doesn't work. Uh, so, but just stepping back a bit for a minute. So look, obviously nobody ever does break the laws of nature. Uh, the laws of nature are, or they're expressed by true generalizations. And if a generalization is true, then obviously nobody in fact ever violates it. That's, you know, truth for you. Mm -hmm. um, so if you assume that, for example, it is in fact true that nobody under the age of 40 is going to enter my house in the next half hour, um, I assume that um, that is going to turn out to be true, that generalization, then, well, if we assume that that generalization is true, uh, well, it follows that the person as a teenager kind of standing on the pavement outside, they're not looking suspicious or anything. They just happen to be standing outside my house. Um, <laughs> 
if it's true that nobody under the age of 40 will enter my house in the next half hour, then it just follows that that teenager is not coming into my house, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it doesn't follow that she can't come into my house. Uh, for example, I left the downstairs window open. She could just climb through the downstairs window. Uh, there are other ways she could get in. Maybe she could break down the front door. Uh, maybe she could get in some other way. Um, of course, if she did any of those things, then our assumed to be true generalization, nobody under the age of 40 will enter my house in the next half hour would be false, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, she could still do that, right? It looks like she she could, in principle, uh, make that generalization false, even though if we assume that the generalization is true, she's not going to. So we can think of the laws of nature, uh, I mean, there might be more than this, but as a first pass, we can think of the laws of nature as true generalizations, uh, but they're different to that generalization, uh, right? The teenager outside, maybe uh, she can climb in through the window. She can't levitate up onto the roof and hurl herself down my chimney. Uh, she can't glide unimpeded through the closed front door. She can't dematerialize like, you know, in Star Trek and then get beamed into the other side of my house. All of those things uh, would break a law of nature, right? Unlike simply opening the downstairs window and climbing through. Mm -hmm. um, and breaking a law of nature, uh, you might think, is impossible. But now here's the move that Lewis makes. He distinguishes between two different ways of breaking a law of nature, which in effect just... Um, uh, distinguish between the teenager uh, being able to climb through the open window and being able to glide unimpeded through the front door. Uh, so uh, there's breaking a law in the sense of doing something that would itself constitute a violation of a law. And then there's breaking a law in the sense of doing something such that if you did it, a law would have been broken. That's going to need some unpacking. Mm -hmm. uh, but what Lewis claims is that while we can't break the laws in the first sense, we can't do anything that would itself constitute a violation of law, uh, we can or we're able to break them in the second sense, in the sense of being able to do something such that if you did it, a law would have been broken. So let's take our teenager again. Uh, roll forward half an hour. Nobody came into the house. Uh, so it turned out to be true that nobody would get into my house under the age of 40 in that half hour period. Uh, was the teenager able to get into my house during that period? Well, she was not able to glide through my front door, right? Uh, yeah. Gliding straight through my closed front door would be an act that would itself violate a law of nature. Uh, according to the laws, uh, this isn't a precise law, but it's near enough. No big solid <laughs> object like a human being ever glides unimpeded through another big solid object like a front door. Uh, you won't get that in physics textbooks, but you'll get stuff that pretty much <laughs> implies that. Right. Um, so since Lewis thinks that gliding through my closed front door would itself violate the laws of nature, he thinks that the teenager couldn't have done that. Right? Obviously, he's in agreement with common sense on that. On the other hand, uh, he thinks that the teenager could have done something such that were she to have done it, a law would have broken. For example, sorry, a law would have been broken. For example, if determinism is true, the laws plus the distant past entailed that she didn't, in fact, climb through the open window. But Lewis thinks she was nonetheless able to climb through the window. I mean, assuming that there were no relevant physical impediments um, and that someone hasn't, you know, erected a big sort of like steel wire mesh in front of my window without me knowing or whatever. Uh, climbing through a ground floor window isn't in itself the breaking of a law of nature. It's a perfectly ordinary event. Uh, people do that kind of thing all the time, unlike levitating onto someone's roof or gliding through a solid object. Mm -hmm. uh, so, of course, if the teenager had climbed through the window, a law would have been broken. Somewhere along the line, things would have had to go differently to the way they actually went. <clears throat> And that would have required a law to have been broken. But since it wouldn't have been her act itself that would have broken the law, Lewis thinks that that's no bar to having been able to climb through the window. Um, so now kind of like <laughs> this kind of, we get to the complicated bit now, but it's kind of important uh, mm -hmm. to see where this distinction of Lewis's is coming from. Um, uh, it's a distinction. So that distinction between the ability to do something that itself breaks the law which is an ability that nobody has, according to Lewis, and the ability to do something such that were you to do it, a law would have been broken, uh, connects up with Lewis's analysis of counterfactuals. So you kind of need to know a little bit about the analysis of counterfactuals to understand um, how that works. So 
counterfactuals are propositions of the form, if this hadn't happened, that wouldn't have happened, or that, that would have happened. Mm -hmm. uh, we go around making counterfactual claims all the time. Uh, if the bus had been late, I wouldn't have arrived on time. If the glass had fallen off the shelf, it would have broken. If that coat had been cheaper, I would have bought it, and so on. Right? We just uh, use of counterfactuals in it is endemic in our daily lives. Um, but question: How do we decide whether a counterfactual is true or false? Uh, we seem to be pretty good in general at uh, kind of deciding whether they're true or false, but it's kind of unclear on what basis we make that decision about whether they're true or false. So Lewis's story goes something like this. So I take the counterfactual. If that glass had fallen off the shelf, it would have broken. Mm -hmm. uh, in normal circumstances, let's assume circumstances were normal, that counterfactual seems true, right? Uh, it's a perfectly ordinary glass. The shelf is quite high up. The floor is uh, uh, quite a hard floor. Uh, the glass wasn't wrapped in bubble wrap or anything. So it seems perfectly true to say that if the glass had fallen off the shelf, it would have broken. Uh, in figuring out whether that's true, Lewis thinks, or this is sort of vaguely the Lewisian way of thinking about it, um, we imagine a possible world or a possible situation, if you like, where the antecedent of that counterfactual true uh, is, is true. The antecedent is the glass fell off the shelf. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, so we imagine a possible world where the antecedent's true, a possible world that's uh, that's as similar as possible to the actual world, consistent with the glass falling off the shelf, right? So in the actual world, the glass didn't fall off the shelf. We imagine a possible situation that's just like the actual situation, uh, except that the glass didn't fall off the shelf. Uh, call that world the closest possible world where the glass falls off the shelf, where closest basically mm -hmm. just means most similar. So there are lots of really distant worlds where the glass falls off the shelf that are really different to the actual world. Uh, a world where the glass falls off the shelf because a kind of marauding reconstructed dinosaur suddenly kind of like blunders into my house and knocks it <laughs> off. Right, that's a really distant possible world. Or a possible world where like the laws of nature are completely different and things, perfectly ordinary glasses sitting on shelves just kind of like fall off because gravity works in this really peculiar way. Uh, that's a really distant possible world. Uh, what's the, so what's the closest possible world like? Well, Lewis thinks that at that world, um, here's one thing that doesn't happen. Not only are there no marauding dinosaurs, but um, what doesn't happen is that the glass just kind of like spontaneously hurls itself off the shelf for no reason at all. The idea is that would be quite a distant world because uh, it's just kind of like not the kind of thing that glasses do. Um, rather, what we imagine is that things kind of went a little bit differently just beforehand. So maybe in that possible world... Uh, uh, oh, my cat. my cat. I don't actually have a cat. I don't know why I've become obsessed with cats. <laughs> maybe in that possible world, my cat knocks it off with her tail. Um, or maybe I act I'm cleaning the shelf and I accidentally knock it off. Uh, or maybe uh, I've left the windows open, the wind blows the door shut and it slams and that dislodges the glass and it falls off or something like that, right? So the closest possible world where the glass falls off the shelf isn't one where the glass just just falls off for no reason. It's a world where things start diverging from the actual world just a tiny bit before the glass falls off. Uh, and then it falls off with like perfectly ordinary reasons. Um, but now assume determinism, given that assumption, the distant past plus the laws entailed that the glass stayed where it was on the shelf and didn't break, right? That's what's exact, exactly what happened in the actual world. Mm -hmm. uh, they also entailed that the cat didn't knock the glass off with its tail. They entailed that there wasn't a gust of wind that slammed the door. They entailed that I didn't knock the glass over while I was cleaning and so on. So that closest possible world where the glass fell off the shelf and one of those things happened is going to be a law where one of the actual laws has been broken, right? The laws, we can assume that the distant past was all the same in that closest possible world because possible worlds with, with very different, different distant pasts are very different to the actual world. Uh, so we're assuming that at that possible world, the past is, is exactly the same as the actual world up until just before the glass falling off the shelf incident. And then something mundane happens cat, tail, gust of wind, whatever. Um, at that point in the actual world, there's a break in the laws of nature. The actual laws are sort of suspended at that world for a moment. Um, so that the cat gets to swish its tail in the right way or the wind blows and the door slams or I uh, dislodge the glass while I'm cleaning or whatever. Mm -hmm. So it's true that if the glass had fallen off the shelf, the glass would have broken. Here's another counterfactual that's gonna be true. 
if the glass had fallen off the shelf, a law would have been broken, right? By the cat swishing its tail or by a sudden gust of wind or whatever it was. Uh, some law or other um, has to have been broken at the closest possible world where the glass falls off the shelf because that's the only way you can get the glass to fall off the shelf, given that the distant past is all the same as the actual world. So, uh, and that kind of law breaking is what Lewis calls a local miracle, hence the term local miracle compatibilism, mm -hmm. uh, which I think was coined by John Fisher. It's not a term that Lewis himself uh, uses in that paper. So, okay, let's get back to our teenager. Uh, the idea here is just the same. Uh, there are plenty of true counterfactuals about what would have happened had she climbed in through the open window. Uh, if she climbed in through the window, she would have ended up in my living room. She would have seen my sofa and so on. Uh, it's also true that had she climbed in through the window, a law of nature would have been broken, just as it's true that if the glass had fallen off the shelf, a law would have been broken. Um, what we shouldn't infer from that, Lewis thinks, is that she wasn't able to climb through the window. Um, it would be implausible to claim that she could have glided through the front door or levitated up onto the roof. She couldn't do those things, but that just gives us no reason to think that she couldn't have climbed in through the window or that she wasn't able to climb in through the window. So that's the backstory. Back to the consequence argument. The consequence argument has as one of its premises that we aren't able to break the laws. And Lewis's claim is that that premise is ambiguous between, on the one hand, the claim that we're unable to do things that break the laws themselves, uh, like levitating up onto the roof, and on the other, the claim that we're unable to do things such that were we to do them, a law would have been broken. Right. So, And he thinks that while the first claim is true, uh, we're unable to do things that break the laws, the teenager couldn't have glided through the front door. Uh, the second claim, we're unable to do things such that were we to do them, a law would have been broken, is false. Right. The teenager could have climbed in through the window, even though had she climbed in through the window, a law would have been broken. Right. The important thing is it wouldn't have been broken by her doing anything. It would have just been broken somewhere a little bit in the past. Maybe it would have suddenly occurred to her that she wanted to go and, you know, steal my TV or, or have a look at the pictures on the wall or whatever. Uh, and then she would have climbed in through the window. So in order to establish that deterministic agents can never do otherwise than what they actually do, the consequence argument needs that second claim to be true. It needs it to be true that we're unable to do things such that were we to do them, a law of nature would be broken. And according to Lewis, that claim just isn't true. So the consequence argument fails. Uh, that was quite a long story. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, listeners yeah. will know when we talked about the consequence argument with Peter Van Inwagen, he mentioned Lewis's response, but despaired of trying to get into the details. So, you know, if listeners were eager to hear more about that, this will be uh, great for them. So yeah, thank mm -hmm. you for going through that. Um, you've written some about local miracle compatibilism, including a 2003 paper, I believe, uh, called Local Miracle Compatibilism that I read in graduate school and learned a ton from. Um, how would you evaluate local miracle compatibilism? Yeah, so um, I would really like local miracle compatibilism to work out. Like, it's just such a, a, a nice line. So so Van Inwagen's view is kind of like, yeah, if anything's going to work for the compatibilist, it's going to be that. Unfortunately, right. it doesn't work. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of with him on that kind of reluctantly. Um, I, in that paper that you mentioned, I, 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 I kind of had a very specific objection, which I'm a bit inclined to think doesn't work. But I think the gen, there's a general sort of way of, thinking about laws of nature that brings out uh, the, 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 like the general worry that I had in mind. So I'm, uh, mm -hmm. why don't I tell you a little bit about the kind of general worry, um, yeah. which is basically this. So imagine a certain kind of incompatibilist response to the Lewis argument that I just gave. And in fact, this is basically Van Inwagen's response. Uh, it goes like this. So hang on. I just don't see any principal difference between doing something that itself breaks the law and doing something such that were I to do it, a law would be broken. I mean, like, what is that distinction for? Like, either way, a law has to be broken for me to do that thing. Uh, surely nobody's able to make it the case that the law has been broken, right? It's just like, I just don't. So I think the. So when I read Van Ingmarken's response to Lewis, I kind of. Uh, I sort of like sort of first response is to kind of be a bit frustrated. Yeah, like that's the entire distinction that Lewis is trying to draw and you're just going, I don't see a distinction here, well, that's a distinction. But actually I think um, 
so it's a kind of like he's got a kind of distinction blindness going on here, Van Imrogen. But actually, I think it, it's it's not a distinction. It's a it, it, it's not a distinction blindness. Um, I think if, in effect, what what that response is saying is, look, there's just we want some kind of principled metaphysical reason to think that we can break the laws in one sense and not the and not the other. And Lewis just doesn't give us a kind of principled metaphysical reason. What he gives us is some like fancy footwork to do with counterfactuals, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think Van Imbolgen's thought is, look, the laws are the laws, right? Doing something that requires a law to be broken is no more something that anyone's able to do than is doing something that itself breaks the law, right? So I just don't mm-hmm. see how it can be that we can break the laws in one sense and not in the other sense. Um, so now I think that the claim that nobody's able to do anything that requires a law to be broken, right, that's the ability that Lewis thinks we do have and Van den Wagen uh, thinks we don't have that ability. Uh, I think uh, thinking that nobody's able to do that um, depends on a certain view about the metaphysics of laws. So roughly a view according to which the laws govern what happens. They exert some kind of power sort of metaphorical power or force over everything including us they kind of like make us do the things that we do mm-hmm. uh but that view of laws is an optional one so if you look outside the free will literature and look into the laws of nature literature um a reasonably popular view about laws is a human view about laws according to which the laws are just a kind of a, a, a class of especially wide raz- ranging cosmic regularities. So in effect, uh, when you're trying to uh, come up with the laws of nature, what you're trying to do is axiomat- there's all this stuff that happens in the universe and you're kind of trying to turn it into some nice axiom- axiomatic system. And the axioms are just the laws. Um, they're just regularities, boring regularities, like nobody in the last half hour under the age of 40 came into my house. They're not going to make it into the list of axioms. They're just kind of like local, pathetic regularities. Force is mass times acceleration. That's a wide ranging cosmic regularity. Uh, uh, so those are the kinds of things that, that turn into that turn out to be laws. So there's no, as it were, metaphysical difference between the laws and those other very boring localized regular um, generalizations, right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there's just a difference in how kind of wide ranging they they are. So the laws don't make it the case that things pan out a certain way on that human view. Uh, instead, they're just generalizations about what in fact happens, right? So, and that's a human view because it doesn't endow the laws with any kind of necessity beyond just logical entailment, right? If you've got such and such initial conditions and you plug in the laws, right, they're just our axioms, you get to infer that Helen's going to raise her arm or make a cup of coffee or whatever it is. Um, now, Lewis had that view about the laws. Uh, in fact, the view I just, got, just described about the axioms is Lewis's official view. And as I say, that's a human view. Um, and I think that's why he was perfectly happy to assert what Van Inwagen denies, which is that deterministic agents are often able to do things that require a law of nature to be broken. But so here's the thing I worry about. Once you've got the human view of laws on the table, it's unclear what principle grounds you have for denying that people aren't able to do things that themselves break the laws. Right. right I mean, yeah. to put it really crudely, nothing's stopping them. Uh <laughs> Mm-hmm. On that human view of laws, in the end, the laws are just a special class of generalizations, right? And we already saw earlier on that because a generalization is true doesn't mean that nobody's able to violate it, right? The fact that as it turned out, it was true that nobody under 40 entered my house in that half hour period didn't render the teenager unable to get in the house, right? She could have just climbed in through the window. So it's unclear why we should think that those generalizations that are laws somehow have some special status such that our acts can't violate them. So I kind of think that Lewis's view requires a kind of unstable view of the laws. Uh, We kind of need to think of them in human terms to make it come out plausible that we're able to do things that require a law to have been broken. But we need to think of them in anti-human terms to make it come out plausible that we're unable to do things that themselves violate the laws. So I'm sort of like coming at this from from the other side to Van Inwag. And uh, I think we both kind of have the thought of like, I don't really see a principal distinction here. And he wants to infer from that because he's an incompatibilist that we can't do things that require the laws to be violated. Whereas I'm kind of on the other side of the fence. And I would say, oh, it turns out we can do things um, that are themselves violations of laws. Mm-hmm. And what you can't have is this kind of Lewisian halfway house where we can break the laws in one sense and not in another. It's kind of like you need mm-hmm. a metaphysical reason to make that kind of distinction. Um, and he doesn't have right. 
a metaphor, metaphysical reason for doing that. He just has a fancy kind of like counterfactual trick reason mm -hmm. for doing yeah. that. That was excellent. So it was great to hear a little bit about the Humean compatibilist position there at the end. Do you think there are any challenges or um, objections or any reasons why someone might favor a rival conception of the laws of nature that kind of keeps you awake at night as a Humean compatibilist or someone attracted to that view? Yeah, so um, yeah, so the Humean compatibilist view kind of follows, follows on from what I just said about Lewis, right? The, the idea that... Um, Right, so you could either go Van in Wagen's way uh, and say that, no, the laws constrain us in, in both of those senses, so Lewis's response fails, or you could go my preferred route, which is to say, oh, the laws just kind of don't constrain us at all. That's the kind of Humean compatibilist view. Uh, so Lewis should kind of embrace the idea that we, uh, we are able to break the laws of nature mm -hmm. in the sense that, uh, not only in the sense that we're able to do things that require the laws to be broken, but also in the sense that uh, our acts themselves violate the laws. Um, so, and then, you, and then you get out of the consequence argument in just a way easier way. And this is the paper that I wrote with Al Mealy that I mentioned right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, we just reject flat out that premise that says that nobody's ever able to break the laws, right? Just right. We don't need to do any fancy Lewis-style disambiguating, right? We just <laughs> deny it. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. I think it's fair to say that that view has not accumulated a lot of followers, mm -hmm. Um if anything, I suspect it's had a kind of like unwanted effect of making people think that that's a reason to deny the human view of laws. Uh, that wasn't really the intention. Uh, and the main reason for that, I mean, like Al and I try and do some fancy footwork in 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 the paper to kind of uh, alleviate this worry. Um, but I, I don't even know that it alleviates the worry for me, let alone for for, for other people. But it, it does sound really odd to say that actually the teenager was in fact able to levitate onto my roof, right? I mean, that, mm -hmm. and that is a consequence of the view. I mean, yeah, you can do some fancy footwork and we do a bit of it sort of saying, well, okay, look, there are lots of senses of, of, of ability. Uh, it depends kind of as it were, what you hold fixed. Right. Uh, uh, being able to, and this is a kind of Lewisian view uh, about modality, uh, what's, what we can and can't do generally. It's kind of like, well, what you can do is relative to what you sort of assume uh, what does that leave open? You can assume not very much, or you can, in which case, loads of things are left open, or you can uh, assume a lot and then not very much is left open. So it's kind of like, yeah, we want to say that in, in, in some fundamental metaphysical sense, the teenager was in fact able to levitate onto my roof, and I am able to run faster than the speed of light or whatever. Um, but of course, in ordinary life, because we just assume that the laws of nature, generally speaking, are true. Uh, we, uh, as it were, we're, we're putting that into the background and then relative to that assumption, turns out we can't do those things. Uh, or for example, uh, while it might be true that the teenager was able to levitate onto my roof, it's not true that had she chosen to levitate onto my roof, she would have succeeded. No, she wouldn't, she would have failed. And the reason for that is uh, you basically plug in the Lewisian story about counterfactuals again. Um, so yeah, uh, it's not uh, that... Uh, I want to be a, I want to be a Humean, um, but once you fully kind of like uh, get your head around what the Humean view uh, involves, it is kind of a little bit, uh, uh, it can kind of generate a sort of Sartrean kind of like uh, existentialist worry about like, I've just got too much freedom now. Yeah. That's like, that's more than I, <laughs> that's more freedom <laughs> than I can really tolerate. Uh, so yeah, I do. Uh, that's the worry about it. Um, and it's, yeah. You know that that's that's just the way humanism goes. So in a sense, if nothing else, I think what that paper did was make people realise that the human view um, kind of like has some quite significant metaphysical consequences, right? It's not just a oh we need a view about the laws of nature. Let's just kind of like pick according to the one that seems to have the kind of uh, I don't know fewest obvious counterexamples or whatever. It's kind of like no, this is a real this is really a story about the kind of the fundamental nature of reality and and some quite big things are going to hinge on what choice you make at that point. Yeah, interesting. Well, thanks so much, Helen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for going into so many views and sketching, especially the local miracle compatibilist position. Um, for listeners who want to follow your work, where can they find you? Uh, yeah, so uh, if you uh, if you just Google me, you'll get to my. Uh, Manchester University webpage probably which has got all my publications on it and a bit about my research interests um, 
I guess it would be quite nice to take this opportunity to make a pitch for two introductory books I've written. One uh, Taylor mentioned at the beginning, which is uh, Free Will in Introduction. That does what it says on the tin. It does actually explain local miracle compatibilism in a bit more detail and also the Humean view. And you know, it's got lots on the consequence argument and various other things. Um, and the other is... Uh, a book called Philosophy, Why It Matters, which I co-authored uh, with a friend of mine, Michael Rush. It's incredibly short and it's an incredibly easy read. It's aimed at people who are new to philosophy. Uh, anyone completely new to philosophy has probably turned off this podcast by now. Because <laughs> their heads will have exploded. But in case any, any of them are still listening, um, uh, yeah, it's a I think it's a nice book. Nice. <clears throat> well, yeah, we'll link both of those in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks Fantastic. again for being with us. You're most welcome. It's been fun. Yeah. In our next episode, we'll be discussing dispositional compatibilism with Kadri Vivalin, professor of philosophy at the University of Southern California.